I want to um, I want to continue our discussion of first order uh, analysis and uh, analysis of coupling in first order and near first order systems. And as I said, the good news is that even though very few of the systems that we deal with are truly first order, many of the systems we deal with can be analyzed as if they were first order, realizing that sometimes you will see some deviation. So today we're going to look at multiplets and look at trying to under really understand them and to extract coupling constants from them. And so we've already talked about multiplets where you have all of the same type of coupling, like a quartet or a septet. And now I want to go and talk about multiplets where we have coupling where you have different coupling constants, you know, to different types of protons. As I said, if you have different types of protons but the coupling constants are the same, so you have a proton that's coupled to a methine on one side and a methylene on the other side, and all three of those coupling constants are the same, no big deal, it's going to be a quartet. You'll see it as a quartet, you can analyze it as a quartet, you can call it a quartet, and that's great. But now we'll look at some first order coupling analysis where we have different coupling constants. And I'll start with a simple example. So remember last time we were talking about typical coupling constants, and I said, well, you know, most of your vicinal couplings, most of your three-bond couplings are about seven hertz, but there are some that fall outside that range. And I said, one of the categories that you have are alkenes. So let's take a moment to think about alkenes, and we'll think about tert butyl, um, I guess technically you'd call this 3,3-dimethyl 1-butene. Uh, so we'll talk about tert butyl ethylene here. So in alkenes, your cis couplings are on the order of about 10 hertz. I think I gave you a range of numbers, and I said if you want to keep one number in your head, 10 is a good number to, to keep in your head. So we'd say, let's say we would expect about 10 hertz. Trans couplings are typically very different than cis couplings. I gave you a range of numbers of about 14 to 18. They said if you want to keep one number in your head, you know, let's keep, let's keep 17 hertz as a typical coupling for trans. And vicinal couplings are all over the map. I said for sp3, a sort of a normal value might be 14 hertz. SP2 tends to be a lot smaller, just a couple of hertz. So if you wanted to keep one number as an expert expectation, you know, I said zero to two hertz, let's say about one hertz. And let's take a look at how these resonances, we would uh, expect them to look. So HA is going to be split by HB and HC. And HC is going to split it with about a 17 hertz coupling constant, and HB is going to split it with about a 10 hertz coupling constant. To put it another way, in the different molecules, HA is going to see some molecules where HB and HC are both spin up, some molecules in which one is spin up and one is spin down, some in which the other is spin up and the other is spin down, and some in which both are spin down. Now in the case of a simple triplet where you have the same coupling constant, if one is spin up and one is spin down or the other is spin up and, you know, and they're swapped, it doesn't make a difference. But if your coupling constants are different, then you're going to see different magnetic environments for those two molecules. And the result is that you're going to, for HA, and indeed we will see for all of the others, get a doublet of doublets where DD, we always name our species by way of the first coupling constant gives the first name, the big coupling constant gives the first name, and the small coupling constant gives the last name. 
In this case, of course, it's moot because its name is doublet of doublets. But as we see when we get to triplet of doublets and doublet of triplets, it's going to matter. So one way to conceptualize these spin interactions is as a splitting diagram. And so we can say that HA is going to be split with a big coupling of 17 hertz. And so I'll just remind us that this is 17 hertz. And each of those lines is going to be further split with a coupling of 10 hertz. And I'm trying my best here to be proportional. And so we would expect We would expect a pattern somewhat like this, four lines with a Lorentzian line shape. Like so. And if I call these lines one, two, three, and four, and we see such a pattern. We see a doublet of doublets. Our big J is always going to be 1 minus 3. And that's going to be the same as 2 minus 4 within the limits of experimental error. Because there is experimental error in peak positions because of things like digital resolution, which says although you're NMR spectrum is depicted as a series of smooth curves. Each curve is actually composed of a series of data points. And the separation of those data points depends on your sweep width and your acquisition time. Typically, you have about 30,000 to 40,000, about 32,000 to, say, 50,000 real data points divided over the entire width of the spectrum. So if your spectrum width is 14 parts per million and you're 500 megahertz, so your, your spectral width is 500 hertz per ppm, your sweep width is 7,000 hertz. And if you have a 30,000 uh, 30, point spectrum, that means each of your points is going to be separated by a few tenths of a hertz, right? by 7,000 divided by the number of points, by let's say 32,000 real points. That would be called a 64K data set, because in the Fourier transform, you collect 64,000 real and you collect 64,000 points in the time domain. And when you do a Fourier transform, that converts you to 32,000 real points in the frequency domain and 32,000 imaginary points in the frequency domain. So that spectrum is going to have 7,000 divided by 30,000 is what, about a, a quarter, about 0.25 or so hertz, right? It would be yeah, about 0 0.25, 0 0.4 hertz digital resolution, which means your points are separated by a few tenths of a hertz. Now, for that very reason, when we report our spectral observations, you don't want to report your coupling constants to better than a tenth of a hertz. Because by the time you're at a hundredth of a hertz, your numbers are insignificant. I mean, think about it. Your Lorentzian line width is on the order of a hertz due to the uncertainty principle and errors in shimming. It's usually about 1.2 hertz. You have a digital resolution of about 0.2 hertz. So that means you can determine the peak position to a couple of tenths of a hertz. So what I typically do to get the best accuracy is I take the position 1 and position 3, and I subtract them. And I take position 2 and 4, and I subtract those. And then I average them. And in this case here, let's say I get 17.0 hertz. And I report this as a DD 17.0, 10.0 hertz. The small j. Similarly, is going to be 1 minus 2 and 3 minus 4. And I would take those and average them and get about 10 hertz. 
You will find on many of the homework problems as you go along and we get to the more advanced part of the course, I include a peak printout. If you want on the PDF, you can simply highlight that peak printout, paste it into Excel, split your data from t using the text to columns command, and then simply in your Excel spreadsheet, just take 1 minus 3 and 2 minus 4 and 1 minus 2 and 3 minus 4 and average them appropriately and get your coupling constant out without having to resort to pencil and paper calculations. All right, so this is HA. Let's take a look at what we'd expect for HB. So HB is going to be split by HA with a coupling constant of 10 hertz, and it's going to be split by HC with a coupling constant of 1 hertz. So it, too, will be a doublet of doublets, and I will try to draw everything proportionately on my blackboards here. And so here we have our 10 hertz. And here we have our 1 hertz. And we get a pattern that looks like so. In HC, we'd also expect to be a doublet of doublets. And here we'd expect it to be, have coupling constants of about 17 hertz and 1 hertz. So again, I will draw my little splitting diagram. And that would be the doublet of doublets that we'd observe. <clears throat> so how does that sound? Huh? Does that make sense? So, question. Uh, the 17 hertz, would that, would that be the distance from 1 to 4? Ah, OK. The distance from 1 to 4. So look, we've moved apart 17 hertz, and then I've moved 5 hertz out here and 5 hertz out here. What? Would be, I'm sorry, 1.5 to 3.5? From 1 to 4? So 1 to 4 is going to be 17 plus 10 hertz, which is 27 hertz. And actually, you've hit upon something that's a super, super point. The difference between the first line in a multiplet and the last line is the sum of all of the j's. Now, by all of the j's, I mean with all of their multiplicities built in. And this is what came up when we were talking about that problem in discussion section, and we were trying to figure out how many hertz the spectrometer was. And so I said, well, let's assume you have a typical triplet. Let's assume a typical coupling is 3 hertz. Remember the problem? The question was, what was the field strength of the spectrometer? And we got 200 and something or 350. And we had one peak that looked like this and another peak that was a sextet. That looked like this. And so one way to do this problem was to measure this distance and say, oh, that's about 7 hertz. But you're measuring it with your ruler, and it's not so accurate. 
So another way to do this is to say, all right, we'll measure this distance. That's going to be 14 hertz. Why? Because a triplet is a proton that's split by two 7 hertz couplings. So 2 times 7 is 14. And then I said, well, the way I did it, which you know, just got a little more accuracy, was to look at the sextet. And since I said all of the J's are about 7 hertz, this distance here from outer line to outer line corresponds to the sum of the five J's, all of which are the same, that are coupling it. So this corresponds to 35 hertz. And what's important about this then is that the distance between the outer lines becomes a checksum. What do I mean? I mean that if you have analyzed your multiplet correctly, and you understand it correctly, and you've extracted all of the j's correctly, then you can go ahead, add up all those j's, and of course if one of the j's is corresponding to a triplet, you add it in twice, and that's going to correspond to the distance between the first and the last. And if you haven't gotten it right, it won't come out right. And what's also important is let's say your multiplet is a little bit broad. And this came up with somebody in the Whirlpool Research Group who was looking at confirmations of oxycarbenium, of cyclic oxycarbenium ions, and couldn't exactly see the size of the multiplet, but he darn well could see whether the multiplet was roughly 7 hertz wide or whether the multiplet was roughly 15 hertz wide. And that was able to tell him whether his proton was axial or equatorial on a cyclohexane type ring, on an, a, a, a pyran ring, and hence uh, the stereochemistry and the confirmation. So this is why this is extremely important. So thoughts or questions? All right. I handed out before, but I realize not everyone brings the paper. I handed out before a two-sided spectra, a two-sided thing. So if you have the handout from last time that had the um, the um, uh, the phenylalanine on it, you don't need to grab a new one. But I decided to make extras because I realize not everybody is prepared. Actually, if we can sweep the sweep the extras over to this side of the room, that'll. That'll take care of a lot of stuff. All right, everyone, everyone have one or the other sort of copy. So let's go ahead and Let's take a look. So this is a real spectrum of 3,3-dimethyl-1-butene that I pulled out of the uh, SIAL website. And then just using Illustrator, just expanded the multiplets and put them on top of a, thank you, a hertz scale. So. Based on this right now, we should very easily be able to see which proton corresponds to which. So this multiplet here is just expanded over here and further expanded on top of a Hertz scale here. These two multiplets here and here are expanded over here and then expand it onto two scales. So which one is this? HA. So that's HA. Which one is this? HC. HC, OK. And this is then HB. All right, let's, let's take a moment to actually read off the scale. Yes, read a ruler, think analog, and see how our actual coupling constants compared to the typical ones. 
So let's analyze the H A and figure out what the two J's are really. We'll do the same for HB and HC. See, is it Rubing? Yeah, I see Rubing is prepared, as am I, with my handy, handy ruler from the bookstore. It really is good to have a scientific ruler here for this. All right, so who wants to, um, to tell me what you got for the two J's in HA? Sound, sounds about right. Okay, so HA is a DD with 18 and 11 hertz. Here would be a good example of where I, we probably couldn't report to uh, more accurately than nearest hertz because we simply don't have the resolution. If I were measuring this on an actual spectrometer and I was able to read with, with accuracy or a peak printout, I would report, for example, this as 5.83 parenthesis DD, J equals whatever I read with accuracy. Here I can only say it would be like 18 and 11.0 hertz. And assuming the integral worked out, I would write it as 1H. And you would report. So this is how you tabulate, how you tabulate NMR data. All right, what about HC? 17 and 2, what did you get? 18 and 2, 18 and 2, so about 18 and 2. It doesn't surprise me that the two coupling constants are the same because coupling constants should be the same. Now, mind you, if I get different values, for example, and again, there's digital error, there's experimental error. If I got 17.4 for one and 17.6 for the other, I would report what I observe, the data that I would observe, I would report for the one 17.4, for the other 17.6, and that's perfectly reasonable. What about for this one? Two and eleven, and we always report it as the big big coupling constant first, and then the small coupling constant. Thoughts or questions on this? These days, well, if you're reporting a whole series, so, so great question. The question is, do you report delta 5.83? So delta means chemical shift in ppm. So yeah, if I'm reporting an individual number, I would probably report it. If I'm tabulating data, these days what people typically do in JOC is say, 
chemical sh shifts are reported in Hertz relative with respect to TMS or with respect to solvent peak. So people typically don't. It's kind of falling out of fashion. But delta was used specifically. Remember I mentioned this obscure tau scale from the 60s? Delta was used specifically to, to indicate it's on the delta scale. Now the tau scale is so much forgotten that people tend not to, not to put as much emphasis on using delta. All right, let's try, let's try some more multiplets. And what I'm going to do, and I'll show you another, another thing that's useful in just a second, but what I'm going to do is give you a handout that has some simulated multiplets. And I'll show you where I got them in just a second. But we can analyze them. So the best way to really, really get an understanding of something is to, is to work through it. And we've already kind of beaten to death a doublet of doublets, so I'm going to, uh, going to skip that and go on. But now we have another pattern, and how would we describe this pattern? triplet of doublets, and I want to come, come to this. All right, so for the purposes of this class, we're always going to name it as big coupling constant dictates the first name, small con coupling constant dictate, dictates the last name. We're going to work through both of them and see the differences. Now, the reason it is important to have agreement on this nomenclature is that if we don't have agreement, then you will have different interpretations of the pattern and in turn how many couplings of different types you have. And when it comes to actually understanding stereochemical relationships, you will get it wrong. Now the only problem is there's a heck of a lot of confusion in the literature. I will make a case for this system of nomenclature. This is what we're going to use in the class. I can show you at least one example where a different system of nomenclature is used. I can also show you an article that analyzes everything in terms of doublet of doublet of doublets. And for example, we call this a DDD with the same J. I take issue with that because people invariably erroneously extract coupling constants by that method and get meaningless numbers. For example, they will measure one distance and call it 1j and another distance and call it the other j. So they'll measure 7.4 and 7.0 and say those are different j's and they're not. It's simply the limits of digital resolution and experimental error. So for the purposes of this class and for the purposes of what makes sense, we will always follow this nomenclature. All right, so let's take a look at why we, we know that our big coupling constant is, I'm sorry, <sighs> doublet of triplets. <laughs> DT. All right, now, now we're on the same page. So a doublet of triplets can be thought of as a pair of triplets.
All right. <laughs> so we split with a big J into a doublet, and then we split with a small j into a triplet. Now, I'll tell you a secret for absolutely every multiplet out there. For every, every, every multiplet out there, the smallest j is the difference between the first and second line and the last and next to last line. Every, every multiplet. And you can work yourself, work your way through and convince yourself. So if we call these peaks 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and we look at them in a peak printout, and I just number them 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Now I have a caveat for you. I've simulated this, and my simulation happens to run from low to high ppm. Typically, when you see a real spectrum, it's going to run from high to low. So typically, one would be at the top, two, three, four, five, six. OK, so small j is always going to be the first and the second, or the last and the next to last. This is simulated data, so the numbers accord exactly. But if I were dealing with real data, what I would do is take and average this. So for example, we have that's 459. So this is a column for hertz. This is a column for ppm. That's the height. That's what you'll see in a typical printout. 459.57 minus 455.30. That number happens to be uh, 4.27. And because this data is synthetic, because it is simulated, I would take the last two and I find that it is exactly the same number for, let's see, 444.70 minus 440.43. And not surprisingly, because it is simulated, it is the exact same number. So within reporting to tenths of a hertz, this is 4.3. With real data, I would take the two and average them. All right. For a doublet of triplets, the distance between the two tall lines, between lines 2 and 5, is always going to be your big J. Depending on the small ratio of the small J to the big J, these two lines may swap. So your big J may be 1 to 4, or it may be 1 to 3 if they swap. So if you know exactly what it is, you can take that. But you can always be safe taking 2 to 5. You can always be safe taking the two biggies. So here, I get that it's 455.30 minus 444.70, and that's 10.6. So if I was reporting this, I would report the data in the order big J, small j, 10.6, 4.3. It would still be considered a doublet of triplets. And I will show you we can do that pattern in a second. All right. So what I want us to do is work through and do a splitting diagram for this. And I have this graph paper here. And we'll do it just for the sake of ease. We'll do it as one box is a hertz. And what I'll do is a dt of 10 and 4 hertz, just to make it easy. So if I do my splitting diagram, I go ahead and I'm going to split out into 10 for the doublet. So I'm going to go 5 each way. 
So one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. This happens to be eight boxes to the inch graph paper. And then if I continue my splitting diagram, I'm going to split into a triplet with four hertz. And so I'm going to go out each way four and have a line in the center. So I can go out one, two, three, four, out one, two, three, four. And then on this one, I can go out one, two, three. Is this supposed to be two? two, two? No. Do I go two and two? Nope. Because remember, a triplet is a split with two hertz coupling constants. So a triplet is identical to a doublet of doublets with four hertz. So we're doing a little shortcut here. OK, so what I'm saying is a triplet with 4 hertz is this. And that's the same as a, that's the same as a DD with two identical coupling constants. And so we can take a look at that and see what we get. So if I go out like this, I'll try to make it fit as exactly on scale. I'm not drawing on graph paper. And if this is 4, and now we split 4 and 4, we go line with intensity of 1 line with intensity of 2, line with intensity of 1. And so a triplet you're going to, with a 4 hertz coupling constant, is going to move out 4 hertz in each direction. That makes sense, because remember I said that if the total J is 8 hertz, because you have two 4 hertz couplings, then those outer two lines are 8 hertz apart. Does that make sense? And so I can graph this, and I'll graph it with the relative intensities of 1 to 2 to 1, and 1 to 2 to 1. Not to go out 2 hertz on each side. Two, oh, two, oh, okay. So I, I said we're going out 4 hertz because the triplet is 4 and 4. It's two 4 hertz coupling yeah. constants. A triplet with 4 hertz coupling is conceptually the same as a DD with, is indistinguishable from a DD with 4 hertz and 4 hertz. So, so what? I'm sorry? If, if you want, you can draw this. But still name this as a triplet. All right, so let us, let us compare this now to the triplet of doublets. Coupling, coupling pattern. So, of course, a triplet of doublets is something where you have one big couple, you have two big couplings and one small coupling. And you can think of it, so this is a triplet of doublets. And you can think of this as a You can think of it as three doublets or a trio of doublets. And so your big J 
is going to be one minus, and again, we can think of this four, five, six, four, five, six, and our big J is going to be one minus three, which is the same as two minus four, which is the same as three minus five, which is the same as four minus six. So this spacing, this spacing, this spacing, and this spacing all correspond to the triplet. And if I want, the best thing would be to take and average them for maximum accuracy. In this case, with simulated data, I could just say, all right, that's equal to 464.43 minus 453.26. And that number happens to be 11.17. Small j, and as I said, for any multiplet, you can always take first minus second or next to the last minus next to the last minus last. The small j is 1 minus 2, 3 minus 4. 5 minus 6, if I want to, since this is simulated data, I'll just take 464.43 minus 457.92. And I get that that's 6.5. So I would report this as 11.2, 6.5 hertz. That's the maximum resolution of the, of the instrument. And in carbon NMR, where your sweep width is now about 20 times as large, typically your digital resolution is on the order of 1 hertz because you might have 32,000 data points, but your sweep width now might be, for example, 20,000 hertz. And so your digital resolution is about one hertz. So typically, people report J's in the carbon to just the nearest hertz. All right, so let's go ahead and we'll simulate this as a TD116. And so I will make my triplet, and I will go down, and I will go out 11, and I'll go 1, 2, 3, and out 11. And then I'll split each of those into 6 hertz doublets. So I go out one, two, three, one, two, three, go out one, two, three, one, two, three, and out one, two, three, and one, two, three, and I get line, line, line. Line, line, line. That's kind of what they would look like on, say, like an 800 megahertz spectrometer or like a white hot. What's that? Well, you know, the digital resolution, great question. So the digital resolution of an 800 megahertz spectrometer isn't any higher than the digital resolution of a 300 megahertz spectrometer, which means your line width isn't any sharper. So since no matter whether you measure on a big spectrometer or a little spectrometer, 
this distance is still exactly the same, the separation of the lines in Hertz is the same, it'll look pretty similar. It's just if you have tenting due to non-first order effects, AB type of effects, you'll see less of a difference. Now, I want to show you two other things. This one here, can anybody name it real quickly? Do you see the pattern? It's a doublet of triplets. It's a pair of triplets. And whoops. And if you go ahead and you take this line to this line, 2 to 5 is your big J. 1 to 2 and 3 to 4 is your small J. And that'll give you the name of it. This one happens to be 7.8 and 5.9 hertz. All right, I want to show you a couple of tools, and then I want to show you one last pattern. All right, so this is, this is what generated all these peaks. This is downloadable on the website. And so, for example, if I wanted to make a doublet of triplets with 10.6 and 4.3, what I do is simply enter 10.6. And of course, since we have two couplings of 4.3 making up a triplet, I simply enter 4.3 twice, and there's the pattern that we just saw. This just simulates the line width. If the lines are a little fatter or a little thinner, that gives you your Lorentzian line shape, the one that I call line width. The one that we just saw, which was 7.8 and is that one, and the one that we saw before that, which was your triplet of doublets with 11.2 and 6.5 is that one. The same type of tool exists in ChemDoodle. So I can go ahead and simulate a system, for example, with 11.2. Oh, two spins. And 6.5. And there are even little convenient, convenient slider tools that can take us into our doublet of triplets that we just saw. All right, last thing I want to show you, as this will prepare you to tackle just about anything, is this pattern over here. Here we have three distinct coupling constants. So this pattern is a, let me grab the right, right sheet here. Actually, which was the next one on your page? Was it this one or was it this, this one? All right, so I will grab this. No, it was, it was the other one. Uh, all right, so I will grab this one and what? Oh, that is what? You Wait, you have two of the other? All right. All right. So, all right, we will do we will do this one here, which is the last one. We are split with three distinct coupling constants. So it is a doublet of doublet of doublets. And 
If we think about our lines here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Remember, normally you number from the top. All right. We name it big J, medium J, small J. Small J is always the first minus the second, which is one minus two, or the net last and the next to the last, which is seven to, to eight. That's 8.19. I won't do the math. The medium J is always, for a doublet of doublet of doublets, 1 minus 3 or six mi and 6 minus 8. Always, always, always for a doublet of doublets. And that's 10.76. The large J is either. 1 minus 4 or 1 minus 5, and in turn, either 5 minus 8 or uh, 4 minus 8. Rather than deal with those vagaries, remember what I said before, that 1 minus 8 is always the sum of the j's and any, if you have like a triplet in there, you'd use two of those j's. So that is always j small plus j medium plus j large. And in this case, that is 31.91, which means j large is equal to 31.91 minus 10.76 minus 8.19 is equal to 12.96. And so if I report this, it's 13.0, 10.8, 12.96, 2. And I will leave it to you to work through the splitting tree on this. You will get plenty of this in the handout that I've assigned for next week, although given where we're at, you could do for, for this homework set. I'd encourage you to, to at least work through it. It's a workbook handout that goes with today's lecture. So anyway, okay, that's what I, I think I want to say right now. You have all the tools to tackle complex first order and near first order multiplets. Was that, was that one that was up there?